her scream, no, stop it. I heard some gunshots. Drop it, whatever it is, drop it! That does not prove that I killed my wife. We know what happened because the video tells us what happened. The camera doesn't lie. lie, lie. This time on Killers Caught on Camera. In West Virginia, a teenager is killed. Mouth would take a look in her bedroom. Then hidden from view. No one realized she was missing. And in the UK, during a minor traffic stop, a woman is found with two heavy suitcases. Can I just, can I just explain? Full of body parts. What the? In the U.S., Berkeley County, West Virginia. Home to 15-year-old Riley Crossman, who lived with her mother, Chantelle, two younger brothers, and her mother's boyfriend, Andy McCauley. Riley was dating her classmate, Hayden Lacey. Jasmine Cooley was her best friend. We became friends in middle school, and it was very quick how close we became. We would sit out here for hours on end and just talk. We would talk about boys. We would talk about our friends, our lives, especially like school and stuff, and what was bothering us. Our friendship, it reminded me of sisterhood more than anything. And I feel like she was the sister my age that I never got. She stayed here for days on end. She would stay so long that my mom would give her chores <laughs> to do around the house. She was such a good dancer, and she showed that on stage. She was able to just dance her heart out or sing her heart out, and she was just so good at what she did. But on May 7th, 2019, everything changed. I got a phone call, just some preliminary information about a missing 15-year-old Riley Crossman. It's not as normal for a teenager to be missing a couple hours. Chantel was you know, really struggling to make ends meet. She worked two jobs at the time. Um, she would literally finish one shift and then have a short break, and she would start another job. So she worked pretty long hours. It was the end of another busy day for Chantel. Chantel had worked a long shift that day. She wasn't feeling well. Chantel comes home. She said she walked in, uh, that she saw Annie McCauley uh, sitting in a chair. She went upstairs. She saw Riley's door shut. She wasn't going to disturb her. Chantel went to bed. But the one thing that stood out that following morning is Riley almost always uh, would walk into her bedroom and say, hey, Mom, uh, have a good day. I love you, uh, and then leave for school. She doesn't remember Riley saying that. Riley normally walked to school in the morning before Chantel dropped the boys off in the car. Chantel dropped them off, and she went about uh, her day. It wasn't until around the evening hours that she started to noticed that something was wrong. Riley hadn't been in touch with her mother all day. Riley was glued to that cell phone, and a lot of the communication with her mom happened to be through that cell phone because mom was always at work. It wasn't until she came home that evening that she got the phone call from the school that said she wasn't present for school that day. No one realized she was missing. She immediately starts looking around, calling all of Riley's friends. I had come home from school. My mom had come upstairs, and she was on the phone with Riley's grandmother. And she asked me if I had talked to Riley today. And I said, no, I don't think so. So I had tried to text her, and it didn't go through. And I had gone on Snapchat, so I went to go see if she posted anything, and nothing was there. Chantel also tried calling Riley immediately uh, went to a voicemail. 
the police got involved. They kind of took it as a runaway complaint. Riley's father lived nearby. He didn't believe she'd run away. He, in his heart, thought there was something more to this. And that prompted Captain Stapleton of the Sheriff's Department to drive back out to the location. The police headed out to Riley's home. They met up with Riley's mother, Chantel, and her boyfriend, Andy. You mind if we take a look in her bedroom? Hey, Papa. Here are the steps. This is her straight back? Yes, sir. So this is a photo of Riley's bedroom. And at first, it was this messy bedroom. But the more they looked at it, they're like, this isn't matching up. This was her book bag. Debbie said she wore it, but she said the kids already went through everything. Her book bag is there. Her eyeglasses were there. Are those glasses she wears? Yes. Does she, have, does she use them all the time? All the things that if you're going to run away, typically a teenager would take with them. Uh, the cell phone was missing, uh, but uh, her purse was there. Money was there. Money. As they begin to look around this room more, Again, there's a pile of clothes everywhere. They start to notice blood. Blood was on uh, her sheet. The blood was also on the comforter. This is the only mirror we have like this, so I came in yesterday morning, and I don't remember that being there. According to Chantal, Riley's room looked different to how she last saw it. I feel like I would have noticed her book bag still being here, and especially her glasses, because I. This is not exactly the way it was. I've been in here digging and looking to see if there was a note or anything like that. There was no note. The blood samples were sent off for DNA profiling. A missing child investigation was launched. They checked her school, the neighborhood, and community centers. Dogs were brought in to track Riley's scent. We also called K-9 out uh, to check the area, because where she lived at, it actually was walking distance to where she would go to school. We didn't find anything. So they reached out to the cell phone provider, and they were unable to give a ping on the cell phone because the cell phone was turned off. And mom's like, Riley always had her phone charged. It was always plugged in. She never let it go silent. Nobody knew what happened to Riley, but Riley went missing, so everybody just lost it. She wasn't the type of person to just go missing. So whenever anybody would say anything to me, like, do you think she would run off? I'm like, no. But, OK, thanks. There's so many law enforcement officers. Got a couple minutes come down, help us search. They were just everywhere at that point. And any evidence anybody had, like last text messages, anything anybody had, they were on top of. They wanted, they wanted to know who was the last to speak to her, who last had conversations with her. Police started to question the family. Everything that Chantel said, all of her statements matched up. Uh, her younger brothers went to school, what happened that day, their statements matched up. Then it was this discussion with Annie. When's the last time you, you saw her? Uh, like nine, maybe ten-ish. At night? Yeah. And, and, what, and what context was that? Oh, she was here in the house. She went to bed probably, well, I don't know what time she went to bed, but she was, all the kids were in the room by like 9.30, 9, 9.30. Did she ever leave in the morning? No. I left four, I got up four o'clock in the morning, left five. Okay. Go to work. Detectives tried to piece together events. On the Wednesday morning, Andy's colleague, Johnny Walter, picked him up as usual. Normally, when they would pick up Andy uh, at his home in the early morning hours, someone would have to go and bang on the door. Hey, Andy, come on. We got to go to work. Um, I'll call him and see if he's up. So that morning, do you remember if you called him or he called you? Wednesday morning. I want to say he called. This particular morning, Andy couldn't wait to go to work. Andy confirmed to police that he got to work on time and stayed there all day. Were you at work all day on Wednesday? Yeah. 
but Chantel said Andy was missing from work, an absence confirmed by his colleague. And he gets back in roughly, it's probably 2 45. So, so, so he was going a while there. Four, four, almost five hours. Detectives wanted to know where Andy went for five hours the day Riley went missing and called him back in. You know, I just talked to Donnie, right? I saw him leaving. Okay. Would you be surprised if you told me something completely different? Uh, maybe. Do you not remember leaving that job site and going to Red Hill? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We did go to, it did, I'm sorry. We did, you're right. Okay. You're right. We did go to, it, it did a shell. How, how long were you there, Red Hill? Like the rest of the day. Okay. Like the rest of the day. Okay. Were you at that house the entire time fixing the shelves? No. Okay. Where were you at? I was at we had, I was at the other house. Okay. I went and got some we went to got some I went and got some more drugs. Okay. There's Many reasons why people might confess to a lesser crime, so a crime that's less serious than the one you're being accused of. And one of the main reasons is to divert the attention of the police and to basically say, hey, look over here. So it's effectively an alibi. Or I am trying to muddle up the, the investigation and say, yes, you caught me, but for this other thing, not for the, the main thing that you're actually interested in. So it's a, it's a distraction technique most of the time. Would you say that there was enough to still do another line each? Oh, yeah. A couple lines each? Oh, yeah. OK. So you wouldn't have to, you didn't need any more coke? No. You left to go back to get drugs, which doesn't make sense because Johnny Walter is already telling us there was enough cocaine left to do a couple more lines. How long, OK, how long were you gone, roughly? An hour, maybe. An hour and a half. We went from this story to this story. Now we're going to get a third story. This is one of these times you really need to think of what you're telling me, okay? Because you're not being honest. A changing story or changing some of the details of your story is by no means itself an indicator that someone's guilty. But if those changes, those fluctuations in the story are huge, then we should pay attention and say, hey, something's wrong and either all or part of this is a lie. And with guilty people, there is another problem, which is that they often think that there's Basically, they're going to outsmart the police. And so that they can come up with a story that is plausible, that is an alternative to what the police are presenting them. Another problem was that Andy said he left his cell phone at home when he went to work. Police were unable to track his movements through phone data and had to change their tactics. We were lost at that point in time. He fell off grid. We knew that he came back to work roughly four and a half hours. From the time that he left, he was unaccounted for. So he left this neighborhood, got in his truck, and basically tore out of there. Detectives turned to CCTV footage for answers. The task force and other members of law enforcement had already been going up and down Route 9. And they canvassed, they went from every business and every home. And we found cameras from various businesses. A camera attached to Hedgesville School gave them their first breakthrough. These are the cameras you can see up on the right corner and the left corner here that captured Andy McCauley leaving his work site. That was our starting point. We knew the direction of travel. We knew that he was on Route 9, and that was our tracking point at that point in time. One of the, the key factors that we hit him with that he could not deny were, were these video cameras, these surveillance photographs. More crucial evidence emerged from Hayden, Riley's boyfriend, who revealed Riley's final messages. Hayden goes to sleep, we believe, around 10.30 on May 7th. And then you have the series of text messages that come forward. Andy's in her bedroom. She's reaching out to Hayden. Andy's in my room. I'm scared, babe. Hayden fell asleep and didn't see her messages until the following day. Detectives put the evidence to Andy. What if I told you her last text to her boyfriend were saying, don't talk because she still has the FaceTime one. 
Andy's in here. I'm afraid. That's what it said. What if I told you that? I would say that's crazy. The DNA profiling of the blood samples from Riley's bedroom offered up evidence of extreme violence. The DNA that came back matched Riley's DNA. The blood was also mixed with saliva. The crime team also found two additional spots on the sheet. Again, came back for Riley's blood, and the saliva was mixed. We believe Riley's face forced into the pillow. It almost looks like that that's where her nostrils were, that's where her mouth is. There's a separation in between the blood. Riley's last text and the DNA results were a major development. Riley was still nowhere to be found, and police needed to find out exactly what Andy was doing the day Riley went missing. Cameras on the bank of Charlestown provided another clue. Started tracking westward on Route 9, and we came to the bank of Charlestown right here, and we were able to capture video of the same green truck going in that direction. So this was another, another camera that put us in the right direction. And there was a camera right on the corner here, very close to the roadway, and it gave us great footage. Here you can see uh, the green Dodge Ram with the ladder rack on the back heading towards Berkeley Springs. Glimpse by glimpse, frame by frame, the cameras tracked Andy's truck. The next camera that was successful that we found uh, Andy McCauley on was at Murphy's gas station, which is literally within a mile and a half, maybe, from the bank of Charlestown. About four minutes later, he's picked up again, same Dodge Ram truck at the Murphy's Shell gas station that's in Hedgesville. Andy was also caught on camera, rapidly paying for fuel at the Rocks gas station. So the significance of the camera was we had the same truck going out Route 9 at that point in time. We had him leaving the high school, going past the bank of Charlestown. And this camera here put that vehicle going up Route 9 towards Berkeley Springs. But Andy went off grid again, until he was spotted by his former girlfriend, Denise Deaver. We actually had an eyewitness that put his truck here at a specified time frame that, that told us that the, the truck was actually backed up. Police now believed Andy killed Riley, and he hid her body in her bedroom until everyone left. Then he went back and moved her body. This is where the residence used to be. It was uh, bulldozed and demolished, I believe, in 2021. It's hard to understand or to get a feel to it, but there used to be just a, a gravel driveway right here, and he actually backed his truck. Instead of pulling in, he actually backed the bed of his truck to the back door. Police had to find evidence that Riley's body was in Andy's truck. They brought in a specialist team with a cadaver dog, trained to respond to the scent of decomposing human bodies. When this truck is impounded, uh, that was one of the places where Rock was uh, brought in uh, to do his, his investigation. When we go in and we search um, things, they don't tell me anything um, because they don't want it tainting how you worked your dog. So in the Riley Crossman case, um, when we searched the vehicle and we went in, um, as we are going around the vehicle, we got to that back end of that vehicle and he, I saw that change of behavior with my dog. I asked if we could drop the tailgate on the truck. So we dropped the tailgate, he immediately went in and as he went in, he kind of went up along the head rack area and along the wheel well and up underneath the toolbox area, come back along the driver's side wheel well. And at that point, he uh, gave me an indication. As soon as we went up in there, I knew he was in scent because of the way he was acting. So we knew that there was an odor of decomp. And an odor of decomp can come from anything. Brandy was very good in explaining that to us. So we knew that this was a construction vehicle. We knew that you're at job sites, you're cutting drywall, you're working with construction tools. There could be an easy explanation why this dog, or why Rock, uh, the cadaver dog, indicated in the presence of decomp in the back of the vehicle. 
They knew a dead body had been in Andy's truck, but they still didn't know exactly where he went on the day Riley went missing. Until a chance encounter on the edge of town revealed unexpected evidence. Yeah, I believe one of the officers uh, traveled past that. It was just a little little store out, and we'll, and we'll get down there. It's out in the secluded area of Berkeley County. One of the officers frequents that store, and he happened just to go in there and ask, hey, you know, can I, can I check your video? And miraculously, he checked it, and we saw the truck down there. So that was a, a, a complete jackpot, if you want to say. And I think finding that video at Hernandez's was probably the uh, turning point in the investigation. Then, one final camera provided a geographical focus. There's actually a residential home here that gave us our last video footage of Andy McCauley driving that green Dodge truck up the mountain. And what was key about that was it gave us a general sense of time frame because not only did it capture him traveling as we are right now up the mountain, it got him coming back down the mountain. It was right around a 20 minute time frame, maybe a couple minutes under that. So we knew that he had traveled up that mountain and had turned around and basically came right back. Police got a team together and headed up the mountain. The only reason that you're coming up here is either to, one, you live in this area, you're trying to get home, or you are trying to circumvent the other areas of traffic and you are going to go down to the Back Creek area, the actual fishing portion. So basically, there's absolutely no reason that somebody would come here. On May 16th, eight days after Riley was reported missing, investigators started to search the area. Also on the scene was Brandy with her cadaver dog, Rock. I have to look after my dog. Um, he is my asset, and I can't put him in any kind of danger. I got Rock out of the vehicle. Um, Rock actually wanted to go down the hill, and I um, pulled him back up, and we went back up the other way. And as the officer was driving down the hill, he noticed there were a lot of birds in one location. And uh, he smelled something that he had smelled before. He got out, and he saw this body over the hill. Part of our training is um, looking out for evidence, um, especially in cases like this. And so as we walked up on the side of the, the cliff where um, her body had been dumped off of, uh, I saw a bunch of these screws that were there. I mentioned to the forensics, I said, I think I saw these um, screws yesterday in the back of that vehicle. Now, they were very crucial screws. They were very unique and very identifiable, and they were found right here lying essentially next to her. That was another link to everything with him. And upon finding that body, the first thing that we did was put eyes on Andy McCauley. He was working at that job site up by Hedgesville High School. Eight days after Riley was reported missing, her mother's boyfriend, Andy McCauley, was arrested. Our theory in the case was is that when Andy went into that room, he was intending to do something. And I, I don't have any direct evidence of this, but I believe he went in there to sexually assault her. And I think Riley was trying to get help. And the only thing she could possibly do is scream for her mother. And he wasn't going to allow it. Andy couldn't escape the evidence caught by the cameras. Without the videos and without the footage, it would have made this case very difficult to prosecute. Sure, it helps to have a camera catching the, the crime, but we had probably the second best evidence with the cameras catching every other thing involving Annie's movements and Annie's statements that weren't matching up. And then when you looked at that evidence, the jury was able to draw a reasonable conclusion and were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed these crimes. There is no explanation for anyone else other than Annie McCauley. Cameras showed every one of those admissions and then the lies. That was absolutely critical for those cameras that showed that to paint the picture of the jury. On the 4th of November, 2021, Andy McCauley was convicted of first degree murder and child abuse resulting in death. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This candle is the candle I got from her uh, visual the day they uh, announced that her body was found. 
And then the day that they announced that Andy was guilty, they did these personalized necklaces. And it's got her name on them when he was guilty. We did a big balloon releasing. There is no reason that she shouldn't have graduated high school. There was no reason she shouldn't have had her 18th birthday. But I feel like I will do everything in my power to outlive that for her and get those experiences because she deserved them. Everything I do is for Riley at this point. <laughs> In 2020, there were over 5 million CCTV cameras. The COVID pandemic led to a sharp rise in home surveillance and doorbell cameras. And this helped catch more criminals on camera. CCTV sources and video evidence in general has now become crucial in solving crime. Without all these multiple camera sources, a lot of cases would be abandoned. There would be simply not enough evidence to progress them. And now in the UK, you're increasingly likely to be filmed even outside the main cities. There is a significant increase in the use of these types of cameras in rural areas because that's where there's a significant increase in crime. The Forest of Dean, Gloucestershire, England. On the 12th of May, 2020, the UK was in lockdown. Everyone was grounded, confined to their homes. Coronavirus restrictions meant all but essential travel was forbidden. Despite the emergency laws, an unfamiliar vehicle was spotted driving up and down a remote road near the Welsh border. This is a home security camera that we can see. A concerned citizen is actually asking the police to investigate why this car is moving, and the police goes there to investigate. Dr. Vasilios Karagianopoulos is a digital forensics expert in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Portsmouth. The home surveillance camera actually allows the police to identify the license plate. And when they check, the car is registered at an address in Wolverhampton. This is more than 80 miles away from the location where this footage is received from. So the police have a good reason to investigate why this car is moving so far away from its registered address. Police officers pulled the car over and spoke to the male driver of the vehicle. He said he was waiting for a friend. Police reminded him of COVID regulations and sent him on his way. But by 10 o'clock that night, the same vehicle was spotted again lurking near the woodland. The police knew something wasn't right. They went back to check out the vehicle. A woman had just been dropped off by the side of the road with two suitcases in the middle of the night. The police visit the scene where the car was spotted and they actually find a woman in the area with some pieces of luggage close to the car. Okay, can I just can I just explain because as as I, as I said yes. before, as I said before, like I don't. I've had, Step away, I've please. Had, I've had issues with that. Step yeah, away, please. I have to stand there. The police officers inquire about what's in the luggage, and the suspect is actually trying to prevent them from opening the luggage. You're going to get arrested for obstruction, police. All right, I don't want to. I don't want to stop you guys. You are. You are stopping us. You are stopping us. Emmy Polito is a forensic video and audio analyst working with police forces all over the UK. So on this recording, we're actually seeing the suitcase. Uh, we don't know what's inside yet. What the? A very grim discovery is made at the scene where they actually find out that the suitcase contains the remains of a body. The woman found with the suitcases was 28-year-old Garika Gordon. The suspect, Garika Gordon, is caught red-handed with a suitcase containing a dismembered body. But in order to be able to convict her, the police need to find 
a lot more evidence to start building the case and making sure the case is as robust as it can be. Gurika was arrested and charged with murder. The driver was held for assisting an offender. A chance traffic stop turned into a major investigation. The police had to start from scratch to find out how Gurika was involved and the identity of the body in the suitcases. Lozels, Birmingham. With a population of 12,000, an inner city area that has high rates of violence, drugs, and weapon possession. Gurika Gordon was living at a hostel. She came to England from Jamaica, aged seven. A troubled life ensued. She was sexually abused and had to leave the family home after coming out as gay. After Gurika's arrest, forensic analysis of her phone revealed she made a call to a helpline. Part of the transcript revealed issues with another woman. Phoenix Nets was also living in the same hostel. A 28-year-old woman who dreamt of becoming a paramedic. As a child, she was a keen rider and close to her family. Phoenix was desperate to move back to London, but lockdown stalled the move. On the 7th of April, Phoenix sent a worrying text to a friend. There's a girl here who keeps asking me to be sexual. I think I'm going to move back to London. It's scaring me. We can see there's a clear indication that she was concerned about this girl. Coral Dando served on the front line as an officer in the Metropolitan Police in London. She is now a professor of forensic psychology. They may have had a friendship, a female friendship, um, and Gorica wanted to take that further, it would appear. And it seems as if um, Phoenix didn't want that. The information suggests that she was very anxious, very upset about Gorica's sexual advances towards her. And of course, that is a form of sexual violence. And um, it can happen between same, in same-sex relationships um, in the same as it can do in any other relationship. Unwanted uh, sexual attention can have a significant effect psychologically, emotionally, can trigger anxiety. And it seems as if Phoenix was a vulnerable young woman. And I think it triggered a vulnerability response, an anxiety response in a way exactly as we would predict. Vulnerable people are more likely both to be perpetrators of crimes and to be victims of crimes. Both the victim and the perpetrator were vulnerable. So these weren't people who came from really stable environments with lots of resources. These are people who had, in different ways, needs, and these needs weren't being met. Hostels are also a sort of in-between space where you're not meant to stay there forever. You're meant to be there as emergency housing or for a temporary amount of time, and that can lend them a very transitional feel in that people are in and out a lot. And you're encountering strangers and you're sleeping in very close proximity to strangers. In no other context would you be doing that in the same way. And so it can open up new and different dynamics, which can also lead to violence or difficult situations. So it's not to say that hostels are inherently dangerous, it's just that there are a lot of people with existing vulnerabilities in them. With Gurika in custody, digital forensic teams checked the CCTV footage obtained from outside the hostel. So we have CCTV here from the suspect's home, and it's the job of the police to go back days, weeks, even months, to try to find valuable evidence as to what has happened. On the 11th of April, Phoenix was captured on CCTV. But in the early hours of the 16th of April, Another woman living in the hostel heard noises of drilling and banging and someone shouting for help. At around 5.30 in the morning, a search was made on Phoenix's phone. Mobile phones and smartphones are incredibly important to an investigation, not just because of call records, of text messages. In this case, the police were able to identify a number of searches conducted on the mobile phone that were of interest to the investigation. 
One of the searches was how to fix a punctured lung. One was internal bleeding. Can someone recover from getting stabbed? Over the next few days, CCTV from outside the hostel captured a series of unusual activities. The police are trying to get a better picture of exactly what has happened. And as a matter of fact, the CCTV reveals a number of suspicious activities carried out by the suspect. A cover-up appeared to be underway. The suspect is found at the DIY store buying cleaning products. On the 20th of April, a van arrived to collect carpet, a bed and some black bags. The suspect can be seen carrying bin bags, even though the footage is at night and it's a uh, bad quality. When the search history was cross-referenced with CCTV footage and cart purchases, a gruesome picture began to emerge. We also know that the perpetrator was looking for a circular saw. We can actually see a person delivering a big box to the suspect's address that could actually be including the circular saw she purchased. The pathologist's report confirmed the body parts found in the suitcases were dismembered with a circular saw. And police determined through DNA analysis that the dismembered corpse was Phoenix Nets. If you picture dismembering someone, the intense, emotional, visceral sort of gut reaction to that is, that is the worst thing I can possibly think of doing. And so we assume that someone who has gone through with dismembering a body must also have felt that way as they were butchering up a body. But in reality, what we know is that people often see dead bodies no longer as human beings, arguably correctly because they are dead, but they see them as a problem to be solved. They see them as evidence, and so that evidence needs to be gotten rid of somehow. On closer inspection, detectives felt the messages sent from Phoenix's phone after the 16th of April didn't add up. Another very interesting piece of evidence is this message saying, feel free to reach me by email, because obviously email is far more impersonal. You don't have to speak to anyone, and anyone can send an email pretending to be Phoenix. That's when they realize Phoenix is not using her phone anymore, and someone else has her phone. It's not unknown to use the victim's phone to send out text messages, to send out um, information, to deceive the outside world, to suggest that that person is still alive. Um, and that's clearly what's happened here. In a lot of the cases I've seen recently, people have at some point pretended to text on behalf of somebody else, or they've sent an email lying about their whereabouts or the victim's whereabouts. And it's usually to buy themselves more time and to fake that this person is alive for some period of time. As well as impersonating Phoenix in text messages, a voice-altering app was used to send voice notes to Phoenix's family and friends. Of course, these apps can be used in various different ways, and we can see here they can be used for criminal purposes as well. Nowadays, you don't need to be a tech genius to create a deep fake. There's plenty of apps available you can download to your phone or your laptop. I can just capture somebody's voice using a machine, and I can get them to say things they never said. Colin Robinson is an expert in audio forensics at Liverpool John Moores University. He's examined audio evidence from some of the most high-profile cases. A deep fake is a computerized representation of a person's voice or their face. All our voices have very special nuances. The thing is, if you distill it down to numbers, which is what a computer does, you can manipulate those numbers and then put in those nuances that weren't there before. When we use a phone, our expectations of the quality is quite low, isn't it? We know that it's not quite the voice that we're hearing. It's a representation of the voice because of the quality of the microphone and the phone itself. This is where the criminal can take advantage. 
The police really have to be on their toes to be sure they know what they're looking at. When audio evidence appears suspicious, Colin has to look for clues to show the audio has been manipulated. Now, to the untrained eye, this may look normal. But to the trained eye, they will notice that this line here and this line here indicates an edit. And what that means is a piece of audio has been taken out and it's been cut together and spliced together. So when we're analyzing audio files, these are just some of the things that we will look for to see whether the audio has been manipulated. All the fake audio and text messages sent from Phoenix's phone meant her disappearance went undetected. In the coming days, there is a lot of CCTV footage collected relating to the suspect. Leaving her house, cycling about, taking the train, the whole pattern of her movements and how she's moving around the city and the area in general is looking very chaotic. Meticulous analysis of Garika's phone records and thousands of hours of CCTV footage showed regular trips to the forest of Dean, 70 miles from Birmingham, despite early lockdown restrictions. Just 11 days after the night of the murder on April 16th, CCTV revealed another mistake. What is really telling is her visit to a police station. She goes in. She's asking for a charger for a particular brand of phone, but then hands in another brand of phone. The police officer here is actually telling the suspect that She's given the wrong brand of phone for the charger she asked. She takes out a different phone and hands it in to get charged and takes the other phone. She has two mobile phones. Strong evidence that Garika had Phoenix's phone all along. And the most crucial piece of evidence was also captured on CCTV. We also have footage in the daylight of the suspect of carrying suitcases. But at this stage, it became clear dismemberment wasn't considered enough to destroy the evidence of the crime. Gurika was then caught on camera buying fuel in a gas canister in Gloucestershire. We have seen from her internet searches that she is actually looking of ways to dispose of the body. Now we have evidence of her getting petrol in order to achieve that. That night, Garika was found with two suitcases containing charred body parts. You're going to get arrested for obstructing police. I don't want to, I don't want to stop you guys. You are, you are stopping us. You are stopping us. Seems very much by the truncated, short, sharp responses that she gives to the police officer's questions that she hadn't expected to have to give an account. Don't. I've had, Step away, please. I've had, I've had issues with that. Step yes, away, please. Somewhere. She'll be paddling really hard cognitively to try and discourage that police officer or the police officers from accessing, opening the suitcase, which she clearly knows have got um, body parts in them. Um, and once that's been accessed, the game is over. What the? Body-worn cameras, CCTV footage, the home surveillance cameras, the text messages, the internet history. We have a puzzle of information that the investigators can put together and create a very thorough and strong case to convict the suspect. The driver of the vehicle was released without charge, but Garika Gordon was comprehensively caught on camera. She pleaded guilty to Phoenix's murder at Bristol Crown Court on the 21st of April, 2021. She was given a life sentence with a minimum term of 23 years. She planned this murder meticulously, it would seem. And certainly after the murder was committed, 
where it was carried out was cleaned, the body was uh, dismembered, and she'd clearly thought about how she was going to dispose of, of Phoenix's body. In England and Wales, in the year ending 2020, fewer than 7% of the homicides were perpetrated by women. The vast majority of women who kill, kill an abusive partner. So they're either killing as a form of self-defense or they're killing someone who, after many, many years of abuse, they've taken revenge on. It's very rare for women to kill other women. It's also very rare for women to kill someone who they don't know intimately. Remote rural home surveillance was crucial. If police officers hadn't been alerted to a suspicious car driving during lockdown, they wouldn't have come across Gurika near isolated woodland with the suitcases. And Phoenix's murder may never have been solved. <laughs> 